If I walk into a store and I see a marker there and I decide to buy it, this marker probably costs the manufacturer a nickel. Maybe it costs the storekeeper a dime, you know, to, for the profit he wants to make. And I come in and I say, oh, I'll give you 50 cents for that because it's worth at least 50 cents for me because I need the marker to draw on the board and sloppy. So <laughs> what happens is I'll go and I'll, I see it for sale for 50 cents. And to me, it's worth about 75 easy. So I pay 50 cents. It costs the storekeeper maybe a dime. He makes 65 cents. We are both profiting from that transaction. The storekeeper is getting cash and I'm getting an item that I value greater than the amount of money it costs me. I'm coming out ahead. I've just traded 50 cents in for something that I value higher. So we are both benefiting from the society. It just changed hands. But that's what we call the difference of valuation. Everybody values items differently, which is why some people might buy this and some people may say, 50 cents, oh, I don't need that. I'll use a crayon or I'll use a pen or I'll use something else or I'll go look somewhere else that might be cheaper. We all value things differently. As you see, just looking around the room, I can see so many different style of clothes because we're all valuing the clothes differently. We'll buy this, we won't buy that. This one's worth it, this one's not. There may be a designer name brand here and somebody else might be buying generic. That's why we have so much greater variety of goods in our society is because we all have different opinions, we all value them differently, and there's a market for every one of them. Somebody will come out with something new to try to attack that market. The beauty of capitalism is it allows that. It allows all the various opinions and likes and dislikes, and it serves the needs of all of them. As long as there's somebody who would like that and is willing to buy it, there's to be somebody there to produce it. People will produce absolute junk through the course of the year just to see if somebody bites and somebody will. In the 70s, it was a pet rock. It was just a rock and a box, and you could name it and you call it your pet, and people bought a rock and a box and considered it their pets. <laughs> you just never know. Who thought of that? Who thought, you know what? I've got a brilliant idea. I can put a rock in a box and sell it to people. They did. You just never know what's going to take off. It's crazy. That's a beauty. You can't, you cannot tap that. Nobody could know in advance, nobody can plan in advance what people need and when. Just like things you do need supplies for, say, hurricane relief, supplies for anything. You can't know in advance what you're going to need. Nobody can plan and say, we need this much oil this year for all the cars that are going to be driving in the course of the year, because you don't know that. <laughs> in a free market, it doesn't make a difference. We'll get it as we need it, and the prices will determine who needs it or wants it more. That's the difference of capitalism, is that pricing structure, with it, because that is information that goes back and forth. It'll tell us manufacturers, okay, I need to produce more of this because it, people want it more and the prices are going up. The prices are going down, they'll say, okay, I can make more profit doing something else. So they'll get into a different line of work. But don't confuse, I mean, there are people out there who will who'll, um, disparage profit. That makes no sense to me because profit is the difference between what it costs you and what somebody else values that item at. The 65 cent profit that that guy made selling me this marker for 75 cents that cost him 10 cents, that's profit. That is a, the contributing value to society because he had something worth only a dime and he turned it into something worth 75 cents. Just like artwork, you could take a canvas that only costs you a buck, you paint on it, suddenly it's worth a million dollars. What have you done? You've created value to society. Society has benefited from what you've done. You've turned nothing and turned it into something of value. Profit is what you sell it for. Profit is the establishing of the benefit to society. So don't let anybody tell you profits are evil as long as, when we go back to the same two rules, profit wasn't gained by force or fraud. If you go back to force or fraud, now that profit is, is basically bogus. It's not a benefit to society. It is pure and simple a crime where the money is extracted from you. We don't believe in that. Now, the same can be true is can be said of jobs. You'll hear talk about what are we doing with jobs in this country? Well, a job is a similar type of thing. A job is merely a voluntary agreement between two individuals. Any two individuals is a voluntary agreement. One's deciding, hey, I can make more money or have more time on my hands if I hire somebody to work for them. And the other guy is saying, I need to make money. I'll be more than happy to work there and get that money. They agree on it. So I do not believe that any government can create or make jobs. You just can't. You can't force people into voluntary agreements. 
but governments are infamous for destroying jobs or making conditions hard for jobs to exist. And that's unfortunately what's going on here too. When you have the government saying what business owners can and cannot do, now you're limiting how many jobs are gonna be available because you're putting a damper on the whole market. Minimum wage laws, for example. Every time they raise the minimum wage laws, we think, oh, that's great because then all those poor people make a little bit more money. The reverse of that is business owners are saying, I can't afford to pay that. I, I've got this tiny little store. I just need somebody to sweep up. It's not worth it to me. I'll just have to make the other people work harder and not hire that extra person. That's a result. Every time the minimum wage goes up, employment goes down. And it's not even usually affecting the people that you think it's going to affect because there's a lot of people who technically get minimum wage like employees at a restaurant, say a waiter or something, and they're making most of their money on tips anyway. So it's not like it's saving the people you're th thinking they're saving. It's usually hurting the um, unemployed because unemployed, now they can't get jobs because there's fewer jobs because of that. So there's always that unintended consequence you have to worry about. But the government cannot create a job. The government may say, oh yeah, well we'll just hire some people now. Uh, the government will hire people like to do the census. Well, where's that money coming from? It's not like it's coming from a private individual who gets it from his profits that gets it because it's expanding his business because he's hiring a person. When the government hires somebody, it's got to take it from you. And if you don't want to pay it, then guess what? It's just been taken from you by force because you don't think they need to pay that job. It's going to be taken from, you, from your income taxes. So a government job is not a real job. A private individual job is a real job. A government job is kind of phony because there's no way to pay for it and there's no benefit to society by spending the money on that particular job. There's a good example of why there was something about capitalism is kind of interesting. I'm going to jump over to this. There's a book by Leonard Reed called I Pencil. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this book. But it talks about how ingenious the marketplace is and how only in a free marketplace can you get this. A pencil today cannot be produced by any one person or any corporation right now. Nobody knows how to produce a pencil from scratch right now. A simple thing like a pencil, nobody can do it right now because of the specialization of the markets. This little pencil has got wood, lead, what we call rubber, and a little piece of brass fitting holding it all together. There's no one company that makes them all, and there's no one company that even knows how. And you gotta think back to, okay, what's all happening here? Well, the wood is probably being cut from trees and timber grown up in Oregon, and then it's gonna be cut down with saw blades and everything, and thrown in uh, trucks or trains and brought down to California where it's put into mills and chopped up in mills, and then it's gonna be coated with paint, it's gonna be kiln drying, carved up, the lead is coming from some from Salon, where they have mines over there for the graphite, and it's gonna be combined with a few other things, like um, clay from Mississippi and um, in New Mexico, they have some wax that they add to it. Then the uh, rubber, well, it's not really rubber, it's called factus, and it's coming from the Dutch East Indies. And it's also, they get some pumice to mix in there from Italy. And of course the brass, you, you know, you see what I'm getting at? Every little piece is coming from somewhere else in the world. And nobody's doing everything. We've got the market specialized now. There's a company that specializes in brass fittings for pencils. There's a company that specializes in the rubber erasers for pencils. There's a company that specializes in getting wood for pencils. That's the beauty of our system. We move to the most efficient means. We go to where the profits are, we specialize. And that's what has happened to America. That's why we're so successful in the first hundred years is we went from being in all agriculture to where we got more efficient, we got in more um, productivity out of it. So we went from 90% of the people working in agriculture to about 11% of the people working in agriculture and even less. And so what does everybody else do? They're now free to pursue other things. And they started getting into industries and they started to realize that it's a lot more efficient to produce a million pencil leads and have other people put the pencil together rather than do it from scratch. So we specialize, we get more efficient, and it leads to more productivity. That's the difference with our market versus a planned economy where somebody else may decide, okay, let's try to build all this from scratch, and you find out you just can't if you're not capable, if that's not your strengths. So the beauty is the strength, the superior survives and profits, and the inferior will drift off or have to move into more efficient means. You apply your people and your machinery to most efficient means. Now, it's important now to bring up something that you're hearing lately. You're hearing a lot of people talk about those Occupy protesters. And a lot of you may feel a little sympathy for them. 
and in, in, in truth, there's a bit of justifiable anger there. But I believe they're totally misdirecting their anger if they take it out on what we call capitalism. Because first of all, we don't have free capitalism in America, certainly not. The government's controlling us in a variety of ways. There are, a lot of Occupy protesters are angry because of certain people are getting rich and certain people aren't getting rich. And there are certain cases where the, a lot of corporations are making you killing because of the government helping them out and protecting them. This is not capitalism. This is what we call crony capitalism. This is not capitalism. This is not what a marketplace gives you. This is what happens when somebody abuses a marketplace. This is somebody, this is an aberration. This is somebody who's corrupting the system is what's going on here. And it's happening all over the place. If Apple computer puts out an iPod and we all love it, and they put out an iPhone and we all love it, and they put out an iPad and we all love it, and we all keep buying from them and they make a ton of money, good for them. That's fantastic. We should be happy for them for giving us what we thought was well worth paying for, and we love it. I have no intention of going after Apple and criticizing them just because they made money doing what we want them to do. What are they supposed to do? Of course they want to make profits, so they make a better product and we buy it. That's fantastic, and nobody's attacking Apple. Where people get angry about is where the government comes in and picks winners and losers in particular industries. And that's what we see. We see a government will suddenly step in and subsidize somebody or decide to set the rules that help certain people and don't help others. I'm concerned whenever we see a situation like what we have with GE. Um, that's my personal pet peeve. I certainly not say, speaking on behalf of the entire party. But I'm concerned when you have GE, General Electric, a very large corporation, can make a ton of money off certain um, political decisions. And if we decide to go solar or green or whatever technology, and if GE is a leader in that field, if suddenly government money is rushing into GE and GE is making a killing because we make mandatory new light bulbs or we make mandatory fuel efficiency or we make mandatory that people or government buildings use only these new green technologies, we are picking which companies are going to profit in the future. And if the government decides to do that, if this administration decides to push that technology that's going to make GE rich, okay, what I'm concerned about is GE owns NBC and several other television channels. And if you see your television programming suddenly pro-green, pro-this, pro-the administration, pro-any particular party, because they can benefit by it financially, that concerns me. Because now we're not seeing a fair level of playing field for all parties. We're seeing a large corporation donating a large amount of money to politicians who are making decisions that will make that company rich. That's where we get into these shady gray areas here. And that's what people should be angry about. I'm also angry about uh, subsidies for certain industries. Like, this obviously, the, the issue with the um, um, these uh, uh, the new fuels, like the um, the corn oil. Now, the corn is being used as oil for the biofuels. Um, unfortunately, that's costing all of us around the world a ton of money because now our corn growers are making the fuel, even though it's completely inefficient, rather than making food items. And it's causing all of our food items to go up because not only is it if anything is made of corn, but corn is being fed to animals, so it's causing the increase in beef and corn. And, you know, there's a variety of ways that this is impacting us because we're, we're forcing these farmers and subsidizing these farmers to go into industries they shouldn't be going into. One I just read about was the cotton industry. The cotton industry has been donating a ton of money to political candidates and to uh, politicians to get subsidies for the American cotton industry. That's what pe they do. People try to, you know, uh, different uh, industries and groups will try to donate money to politicians to try to get them to push in favors. In this case, they're actually getting directly subsidized by the federal government to produce cotton. The problem is, by doing so, we've just broken our agreements with the, in the World Trade Organization. And so Brazil has just sued us on the World Trade Organization for our subsidies to our own American cotton. So what happened? Uh, we lost, and so to make it up to Brazil, we are now subsidizing Brazilian cotton, cotton farmers too. 